uh, to disclose, oh, first, thanks a lot for having me here. I always enjoy um, sharing to, especially uh, Dr. Raid's uh, students. I find them really, really energetic, and also David as well. Uh, I find this event, um, or just skip all this BS. Anyway, um, so, uh, <laughs> um, oh, yeah, yeah, because I prepared this uh, presentation and then I got like drag on and drag on because I felt like it's more like a summary of the um, journey I've been through for the past six years. I'm in my mid-35 and I agree totally what Lawrence just said. Um, in Hong Kong you will find that entrepreneurial people they don't um, they don't just come out fresh from school. Um, I think it's a lot of cultural influence uh, but anyway when you find uh, sort of entrepreneurial uh, ventures in Hong Kong, most of them are made up of, um, made up, uh, made of, uh, made by people like uh, us around our um, mid 35s. I, I, I think it's because um, we've been through all those uh, job and then we now have our industry know-how, we spot opportunities in the market that we know particularly well. Um, so now I understand because in our audience, a lot of you are very young students. Um, what are we going to do with our 10 years in between? If you know the trend is um, you, you need to start your business in 10 years, what are you going to do and how are you going to make the most out of it? Um, that's why it comes to uh, this topic, uh, started out with no seat money and becoming a business that every investor will love. And, um, the reason why I come up with this topic is because I need to tell you guys an inconvenient truth. Is that when you're in Hong Kong and you kind of got stuck here for some reason, um, you need to face the fact that you don't get seed money so easily. I mean, we have wonderful places, Nine Nest, and a lot of accelerating program. But again, when we compare this with Silicon Valley, it's still very, very difficult. Um, it, it has to. Uh, it has a lot to do with the ecosystem, um, but we just need to deal with it and we need to find a solution to that. And it got me thinking, um, particularly like this few years when we had our uh, ups and downs with our startups, that there must be some other way that we can do startup here. Uh, we just not necessarily follow the start, uh, Silicon Valley model. Um, so I have to go through it very, very quickly because um, I don't know how familiar you are with, with the Silicon, um, sort of Silicon Valley startup ecosystem and why it works. It's because it started off by, um, by the Stanford, basically, and they are an engineering school. And engineering um, and hardware, uh, when they come up with a successful startup, it takes a lot of money to initiate the project. I mean, like, a lot, huge money, like build your own lab and then build your own machine. So successful startup by then, the definition is quite about technology. And then that's why you need your seed money. And um, you know, by today's standard, it probably would, um, would be approximately like 500,000 to 1 million seed money we're talking about. And then you need further rounds because you know, those investors of the seed round, they need to make money out of those. So you need further rounds to sort of um, increase the valuation of your company. And then ultimately, a successful startup means you will be able to exit um, by any options or uh, through acquisition that you get back money for your investors so that they can pocket their money in. And um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of students in Hong Kong, they don't get it. Uh, I think it's because of the media now in Hong Kong. The coverage is always about the seed money and then series A round. Um, and it doesn't make sense because, you know, get your get your seat round money doesn't necessarily make you successful. Um, we need to present the young, uh, young generation the full story. Um, so now, of course, like after so many years, the Silicon Valley, um, they sort of have a, have a secret recipe. So now the successful startup, not necessarily about a hardcore gadget technology company, but um, you know, companies that are that they, they have very, very strong team. They know the sort of um, uh, secret recipe to have a um, strong execution through leveraging technology, and I'll get to that later. But again, if you, um, if you take a look at this, this picture, you still get your seat round and your further rounds. What does that mean? That means um, you still have the pressure to grow, you know, to grow really, really big. And, um, and that also comes to the sort of like uh, inflation 
that you know um, a lot of Silicon Valley startups now they are close to one billion valuation. And if you um, have time, you can read this issue uh, of Fortune magazine. They are sort of doing a lot of statistics showing that even as successful as Jawbone, they are very big. They still don't live up to that um, sort of over one billion valuation. They need to be squeezed for more growth, for more profit. So um, the reason why I brought it up is because it's not necessarily to be like that. Like in Hong Kong, um, why I say so is because we don't have this round. We just need to face it. Um, it's not as easy to get it. And if we take this out from the equation, then we can ask ourselves it is necessary to grow and to grow to this magnitude of a uh, company. And that sort of is a good thing, the way I interpret it, is then because we can focus on, um, you know, generating profit, real profit from user, from our business model. And the focus um, can be on the team and execution. And since we take away the sort of seat round, we don't even need to answer to, you know, um, investment deck, how much do my team cost? Uh, how much is my execution power worth? Um, I think it's a way out for all of us. Uh, and the benefit of it is, as I said, we can now focus on our um, team and our execution. And one thing I can point out is we, um, all the young generation here, we should uh, equip ourselves to think bigger business model. Um, more scalable business model. Uh, I think this is one part where we are very weak. Um, I, I've been in touch with a lot of local startups, and we always start from a very simple uh, local market-focused concept. And there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that, because we are close to the market. What we need to sort of force ourselves to go one step forward is we need to think bigger. We need to come up with a model and an execution operation model that can be scaled. Um, can be scaled out so that we can have market expansion, so that we can roll out to uh, replicate in other um, markets. Um, and the second benefit is we now have a choice. Um, we are not sort of um, be obliged to grow other people's money. So if you come up with a team and then you come up with a business, um, when you can earn three million a year, uh, you know you can do the mathematics. It would be quite um, comfortable for the team, amount yourself to share the money, or of course then you will have a business that make a lot of sense to potential investors. And indeed, um, these are the businesses that investors really, really love. Um, but uh, again, it's, uh, it sounds very good, but why we don't see more of this is because it's really not for everyone. I think Lawrence just pointed out that. Um, when you are starting your own business, uh, you're facing a lot of risk. Um, I have a cousin which I respect a lot. Is He's facing a lot of family pressure, um, peer pressure, won't be able to go out to karaoke um, during the weekend. And then people will ask you how much you are making when you sit with your um, sort of classmates peer. Then you're sort of being put that weirdo hat, you know, on you. And, um, you know, there, there will be the sense of insecurities and it's just a lot of uncertainties, but it's very, very fulfilling. Um, oh, and also, will you be able to handle to make that first phone call to ca get your client because you, you don't have your investor money in your pocket? You really need to make that phone call. You really need to get your first merchant on board. Uh, I know um, many young, young uh, people these days, um, they don't even want to pick up the phone and call because WhatsApp is so convenient now. Uh, sometimes I doubt whether they know how to dial the, the, the thing. Um, anyway, so this is the challenge that you need to ask yourself, are you ready for it? Uh, are you, you know, geared up for this thing? Um, but there is always a solution. There always is a solution. Um, so here is, again, as I point out, it's always about team and execution. And as I said, it's not discriminative in nature of these things. It's not because like you are in Silicon Valley, that's why you are more superior than I am here. Um, so first, um, being innovative about this whole thing, about this approach to getting team members and um, 
and you know, having strong execution. And what I meant is, when you look at um, you know, product innovation, it's not just about product innovation, it's about business innovation. And I like to see a startup or any business in two dimensions. The first one is you know, offering uniqueness, and you know, the um, sort of horizontal dimension is um, execution, so that your business will be sustainable. It's not just about you know, coming up with a very wild wow product and get your first um, 10 million users, then what, right? So it's, um, first, uh, this is what we are familiar with, product innovation. Uh, or even surface innovation, the very expensive um, sort of models we have in mind. The good news is there are, much, uh, there are many more um, dimensions where you can apply your innovativeness on. Uh, I would like to think of process innovation, like Spotify is not necessarily to be CD, it can be some other things. Um, uh, and then you have your business model uh, innovation, and I like to use Line as an example because we have been in the messenger business uh, before, and then uh, we were not innovative enough. Uh, we had Talkbox, and then we got our 10 million users, but then we got stuck because they are free users. So um, whenever another, another user that got on board is actually burning our money, we wasn't really thinking. And Line, I think they came up with a wonderful business model is they let you use your messenger for free, but you pay for their stickers. I mean, it takes a lot of customer insights to understand that, you know, people will pay for their stickers and emoticons and a lot of more games than that. And this is a, a true innovation uh, of, um, on business model. And then is uh, marketing innovation. Um, and I think Silicon Valley, those people, they stop talking about marketing now because they, they really believe marketing or you know, promoting your product is ingrained in your whole um, sort of product delivery process. So they call it um, growth hacking. And I kind of like this uh, name. Uh, if you've been to my previous uh, Cal talk, uh, you, you know that I talked about this um, topic. Uh, Dropbox is a wonderful example. You know, uh, cloud storage, so, uh, just such a dull thing. How they get you to, um, you know, make itself viral so that you would refer more friends to use it is they give you free storage space which otherwise you need to pay for so it's an, it's an example of marketing innovation um, and then supply chain innovation you know Airbnb is basically another listing com uh, sort of uh, rental listing company directory um, they sort of uh, in a, in, um, sort of re-engineering the whole thing um, and then organizational innovation, and I want to um, uh, sort of emphasize on this one because uh, some of my good friends here, they are doing startups, and then they use this model so successfully, you, not, you do not necessarily hear about them on, on, on press, on paper, but they are so successful. Why? Because what, what's um, the advantage we have in Hong Kong is fast internet. We might not have the people with the skill sets, but we have fast internet and very, very transparent communication channels. So um, like uh, Leo, who um, worked on Lifehack, he, he um, sort of built Lifehack, which is a block, just a block, but he's making a lot of money. And uh, also One Sky, which is created by Greg, and is basically a translation uh, company. And how they did it, they are talking about managing 100 to 200 people in one day. And how, they, how do they do it? And they are actually using a lot of technology and a lot of um, monitoring tools so that they are able to manage their remote workforce around the world. I mean, these 100-something people, they're not based out in Hong Kong, and then they don't need to pay for their MPF or cover their insurance. So it's, um, it's a way that they reinvent uh, organizational approach. And again, um, the reason why I pointed out is because I think at the end of the day, uh, who's got to win is those with the right um, skill set, and it's essentially is people power. And I totally believe we have that in Hong Kong. So um, just some recommendation of reading list is uh, I like to um, it, I like to uh, recommend like the Blue um, Ocean Strategies that you can sort of um, find untapped marketplace. Especially if you have your own domain, then you will know you know what's the weak link um, during that value chain. And then this um, these titles I think we are all very familiar with. Um, going quickly to the second point is uh, we talk about 
team and execution, and we always have the problem of finding our co-founders. Uh, I don't know whether you have faced it or not. It's because when you have a good idea or you, you crack one part of the engineering process, it's always very difficult to find your partners. Um, you can't really do it on your own. And you know the traditional sort of um, approach, which is I, I like to call it a DAC centric approach, is um, is 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 I think it's being widely used uh, by uh, startups these days. Is first they came up with an idea, and I hate to admit that, but um, most of the time is they want to come up with something the VC like. You know what's in the trend, what the you know is it social startup, is it whatever, and then they came up with the plan, which is the deck that they need to present to the VC, and um, and then the third step would be, then they are forced to find their co-founders you know, um, the founding team that can fulfill uh, what's been promised on this deck. Um, and then they will do the prototyping so that they can get the resources, which most of the time now is uh, VC money, so that they can build the office and that. And then with the prototype, then they roll out to the market. And, um, and then sort of they create the product um, around that startup brand. Uh, and then so that if that is successful, if they get to further rounds, then they can build um, you know, a, a, a company or grow the organization according to, to this plan. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, and it's a very efficient model. In, uh, it makes a lot of commercial sense. The thing is, um, this is more like a uh, one-way journey, where even by um, step three, you, you are sort of um, locked by this idea and this plan. And I think a lot of you, if you've been to a uh, sort of a startup process, you will know that idea isn't as static as this. Um, we need a lot of changes, we need a lot of tweaking, and even our belief will be shaken. Um, day one, we believe that this is something that's gonna work. Um, I think by the third week, you already question yourself. So, um, and as I point out, because now we are sort of relieved from the pressure of, you know, really need to going after the VC money, um, we inside Green Tomato, we need to, we like to use a human-centric resources approach. And what does that mean? It means that it's always um, generated by conversations among a few people. And it's just passionately talking about something, just random ideas, um, things that, or opportunities that um, they just come across. Uh, and then they would bring to the table what they can you know, offer to the team. Someone's good with coding, someone is um, you know, good with saying no, someone is good with uh, execution. And then uh, they can sort of use the Lean Startup model to repivoting. Um, themselves, you know, uh, validating their idea, sort of test their own commitment to, to this whole project. Uh, and then they would be vigorously finding what is the unfair uh, advantages that they can bring to this um, company. And a lot of time in Hong Kong especially, it would be, you know, the industry domain or even, um, you know, my uncle is in the, in the sort of so-and-so um, -so industry and then he got this, you know, um, particular connections with someone. And even that is an unfair advantage that they can leverage. Um, so that, you know, they, they can test the market, fail, um, try again and retesting it. Um, and then, it's an organic uh, thing is when you have all that laid out in plan, they can attract people who believe that they have the power to execute this idea. And um, that would be mentors. I think mentorship is very important in this um, whole journey, especially those with industry domain. Um, you really need to talk to the people in the know, um, sponsor first clients and your early adopter users so that you can come up with a plan. And the plan is more, more or less like naturally emerged. It's, it's more like a magical process that, ooh, something really works and someone is willing to pay for it. And you will see that sign up button um, uh, being clicked many times. Uh, and then the, the thing is why uh, we like to use this model is because um, 
it, it, it's quite a Chinese thinking. We would like to uh, we like to call it Tinsi Dele Yanwo, so that we can leverage on the right time, right place, and right people. And this is the model that we like to use. Um, since I'm running out of time, uh, I probably want to stop here reluctantly. Um, but uh, I hope we, I can have another chance to share again with you because I have a few more slides I want to show. But um, anyway, hope uh, I can have another uh, chance to do that. Thank you.